Tonight we explore Mariology and Marian devotion in the second thousand years since the first century, particularly in Western Christianity, Catholicism, and Protestantism. We will go from the Middle Ages right up to the eve of the Second Vatican Council, 1962. Let's begin. By the Middle Ages, theology in the West, the Latin West, had become increasingly divorced from the Bible. A rational, deductive kind of argumentation prevailed. One form of argumentation was known as the argument from convenience. Its structure was simple. Potuit, desuit, ergo, fecit. God, or Christ, could do something. Potuit. It was fitting that he should. Desuit. Ergo, therefore, he did it. Fesit. Potuit, desuit, ergo, fesuit. This principle would play a large role in the evolution of medieval Mariology. God could do something. It was fitting that he did that something. Therefore, he did that something. One of the most influential of all medieval theologians on the development of Mariology was St. Bernard of Clairvaux. His sermons in praise of the Virgin Mary were as persuasive as the legend of Theophilus in confirming the medieval Christian in his or her childlike trust in the all-powerful help of Mary. Bernard influenced other theological areas as well. And Mary, in his theology, in his Mariology, had an intimate role in the work of redemption. Bernard of Clairvaux saw Mary as the aqueduct that leads the waters of divine grace down to earth. In Bernard's theology, God willed us to have, quote, everything through Mary, end quote. And that's saying everything through Mary would become a principle in Mariology to be repeated again and again by popes, theologians, and spiritual writers right down to Pope Pius XII in the middle of the 20th century and the eve of the Second Vatican Council. To understand that controversial phrase, everything through Mary, let's turn our focus to the gospel called John, and how medieval Western Christians who could read, read it. As John composed it to his anti-society, the Cana story, John chapter 12 verses 1 through 12, marks the conclusion of a series of events that begin in the fourth gospel's first chapter, John chapter 1, verse 1, and following. The fourth gospel begins with a kind of recapping of the creation story found in the Bible's first book called Genesis. The first words are even the same as the first words of Genesis. Genesis begins Bereshith, at the head or at the start, in the beginning. God created the heavens or the sky vaults and the earth. John chapter 1, verse 1, an arche and hologos, in the beginning, an arche, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was turned toward God, and what the Word was, God also was. He was in the beginning with God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Come on in. Sorry. So medieval Christians in the West who could read and write got that. They, they could read John in the beginning. They could read Genesis in the beginning and go, hmm, the author of John intended there to be a relationship. That's not a bad idea. That's right. 
As the first verses of Genesis describe God creating light and separating it from darkness, so in the fourth gospel's first verses, called John, Jesus is described as a light shining in the darkness. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning God created the sky vaults and the earth, and the earth was tohu wabohu, formless emptiness. And darkness covered the tehom, the abyss, while the ruach Elohim, the breath of God, or the wind of God, swept over the hamayim, the waters. Then God said, Yehior, let there be light, and there was light. God saw how good the light was. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Thus evening came, morning followed the first day. John chapter 1 verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was turned toward God. And what God was, the Word was. He was in the beginning with God. Right, that makes sense to Genesis, thought the medieval writer, the medieval author, the medieval reader of John and Genesis, he could see. Yeah, in the beginning was God, and God in the beginning was speaking things into existence by his all-powerful word, right? God said, let there be light. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and on and on. So when John says, in the beginning was the word, yeah, that, that, that relates, that makes sense, that makes sense. Y'all got that? Does that make sense? Is anybody lost here? No? We're all good? All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life, and his life was the light of humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. it seems to be that to the medieval writer, to the medieval Christian thinker, John was clearly thinking about Genesis when he wrote his first chapter. Would you agree? Medieval Western Christians who could read and write got that also. Good. Okay, we're on the same page. Genesis shows us in the beginning the Spirit of God, or the breath of God, moving over the face of the waters. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. In the beginning God created the sky vaults and the earth. The earth was tohu wabohu. The darkness covered the tehom. While the Ruach of God, the breath of God, the wind of God, the Spirit of God, swept over the waters. All those translations are correct. Because we're wind and spirit and breath in Hebrew, Ruach, and in Greek, Pneuma, where you get pneumonia from, they're the same word. And in Latin, too. Respiration, inspiration, expiration, when somebody dies, right? Expire. It's all about what? Breath and wind and spirit. Spire, spirit. John chapter 1, verses 32 to 33. John, the dunker, testified further, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from the sky and remain on him. I did not know him, Jesus, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, On whomever you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Look at the two texts. In both the texts you have a kind of a creation going on, don't you? And the Spirit coming down over the face of the waters in John and in Genesis. So the Gospel of John in turn shows us the Spirit hovering above the waters at baptism, just as Genesis shows us the breath of God or Spirit of God hovering over the waters at creation. So, medieval Western Christians reading both these texts, who could read and write, right, also got that. In Genesis, that's the word Shabbat, the seventh day, the, sab the Sabbath, is the pinnacle of creation, when creation is completed, sanctified, and perfected. The Sabbath is instituted on the seventh day as an everlasting token of God's perpetual covenant with creation. Exodus 31, verses 16 to 17. It reads this way. So shall the Israelites observe the Sabbath, keeping it throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Between me and the Israelites, it is to be an everlasting token. For in six days, 
Yahweh made the sky vaults and the earth, but on the seventh day he rested at his ease. The same Greek word translated token to describe the Sabbath is also used in John's Cana story. When Jesus does at Cana, what he does at Cana, at the wedding at Cana, in John chapter 2, is described as the beginning of his seven signs. John chapter 2, verse 11. Jesus did this at the, as the beginning of his signs in Cana, in Galilee, and so revealed his doxa, his glory. And his disciples began to believe into him. Medieval Western Christians who could read and write got that relationship also. From all of this now, medieval Western Christians who could read and write then began to spiritually read that Mary, who is present at the wedding of Cana, wedding in Cana, must also be somehow mystically present on the new Sabbath of God's new creation, which was being inaugurated at the great wonder Jesus does at Cana by producing the wine out of the water. Now, is that what John intended, the author? What do you think? Or is that a further development? Of further development, right? That, that, yeah, we got those relationships, sure. But is, does, does the author call we call John? We don't know his real name. The beloved one. Did he actually intend that in the literal sense of what he was writing? Whatever the case may be, medieval Christians reading this understood that just as the Sabbath was the sign of God's first covenant. Mary, the mother of God, is a part of the sign of God's new and everlasting covenant with his creation in Christ. Okay, but it, that's not what John meant. Okay. Now, the literate medieval Christians continued their, their development. They saw that in the creation story, only the name of God was spoken. And the first man and woman, they got identified, but they were not named until after later on. They're called Ish, the man, and Isha, the woman. In Allegory Gone Wild, our medieval ancestors in the faith saw the same thing happening in the Cana story. Only Jesus gets named in the Cana story, and he's God. Whereas Mary, human, is never named. She's called woman. Right? Woman, what has this to do with you or me? My hour has not yet come. She's never named in the fourth gospel we call John. Neither is the beloved disciple. Neither are the two people getting married. Only Jesus is named. And so the medieval Christian reading that went, Oh, that's because only God is named back in Genesis. Is that why John didn't name any other character? I'm asking you. But we'll go with that. Remember that John refers to the mother of Jesus as, as Jesus referred to her as, woman. At the cross, woman, behold thy son. Right? You remember that? Woman, that's like Eve, right? Aha! So they made the, the medieval Christian was able to make a connect the dots between Eve and Mary. See that? Is that what John intended? Okay. 
But to our Western medieval ancestors in the faith, this was just another indicator that John intends us to find something deeper, something more symbolic, a deeper connection between what happens in Cana and the Genesis myth. So now an allegory gone wild, we have left the author called John, the author of the fourth gospel, in the dust. You see? Our medieval ancestors in the faith did not treat the New Testament as a library, as we post-Vatican II Catholics must, with different genres of literature. They believe wrongly that the author of the fourth gospel, whom they thought literally was John, son of Zebedee, a fisherman, would a day laborer in the Galilean villages of Capernaum and Bethsaida, working as a fisherman, be literate, folks. Those of you who have come to Bible Alive, no. Would he be able to write incredibly highly developed text like John? with theological ingenious stories put into it. Nope. Okay. But they wrongly believe that the same author who wrote John is John of Patmos who had the visions in the book of Revelation. They thought they were the same guy. Do we as Catholics have to believe that? That they're the same person? No. They understood the woman and the dragon in Revelation chapters 11 to 12 pointing to creation in Genesis because, you know, the woman in Genesis chapter 3, Eve, is at war with the serpent. Okay, the author of Revelation does tell us that that serpent is the same serpent as in, Revela as in Genesis 3. Yes, he does. He does. But does he say that the woman in the sky, the gigantic pregnant woman in the sky in Revelation 12 is the same woman as in Genesis chapter 3? Eve? No, he does not. It's the same dragon. It's the same dragon, but it's not the same woman. It's not the same woman. Not in the literal sense, but the medieval Christians didn't get that. See? They believe that they had to look toward the creation story of Genesis for the background of the wedding at Cana story in John, also to understand the narrative of the fourth gospel. Many of our medieval Western Christian ancestors in the faith believed that the gigantic pregnant woman in the book of Revelation was Mary, the queen of heaven. After all, she's crowned with stars, queen of heaven. As with the woman of Revelation, Mary in the fourth gospel is also called woman. Woman, what does this have to do with you or me? My hour is not yet come. Woman, behold thy son. Woman, it must be. That must be the woman in Revelation. That must be the woman in Genesis. Also, Mary, who's never named in John, is presented at Cana in John chapter 2 as the mother of the Messiah, Jesus. And they thought... She was presented as the church in the book of Revelation. Revelation and John were never written to be cross-referenced like that, folks. But they got canonized together. And when they got canonized together, suddenly roads could be established, right? Roads could be established by non-critical readers who are treating these books like chapters in one novel or different parts of the same map, rather than as a library. Ta Biblia. Reading things this way into the text, our medieval Christian ancestors in the faith saw the mother of Jesus in the Gospel called John is also associated with his disciples. They were with her at the wedding at Cana. Just as the pregnant woman in Revelation is the mother of those who bear witness to Jesus. Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. She gave birth to a son, this gigantic woman in the sky, a male child destined to rule all the nations with an iron rod, 
Her child was caught up to God on the other side of the sky vault, his throne. Verse 17, Then the dragon became angry with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commandments and bear witness to Jesus. The medieval Christian looked at this. Indeed, at Cana, the mother of Jesus called by Jesus woman is the catalyst for the sign and work that manifests Jesus' glory and causes his disciples to begin to believe, to him, believe into him. John chapter 2, verse 3. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Verse 11, Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana and Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe into him. It's the actual right translation, into. Those of us who've been to Bible Alive, recall who the pregnant woman was in the literal sense of, not spiritual, like the medieval Christian is reading not the spiritual sense but the literal sense who was the the gigantic pregnant woman in the sky crowned with 12 stars the constellation we call virgo in the literal sense of genesis the only pregnant woman in the sky who's the lamb by the way in revelation the, the lamb that's slain the constellation we call aries what's the constellation that looks like a lion Remember, for the first century follower of Jesus, all those things in the sky, they don't think of them scientifically as balls of gas. They think of them as non-human persons, part of God's Downton Abbey in the sky, his entourage. So there's the literal sense, and then there's the spiritual sense. And the medieval Christian folks forgot about the literal sense and allegorized everything. And the Holy Spirit works in that mess, folks. Amen? We hope so. He works in our mess, doesn't he? Let's hope. The only other appearance of this woman in the fourth gospel happens to be at the foot of the cross. Here again, she is portrayed as the mother of disciples, that is, as the church herself. John chapter 19, verse 26 to 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples, he's hanging on the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he, there, whom he loved, whom he was attached to, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Again, he calls her woman, see? Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. <laughs> Jesus designates her the mother of his beloved disciple, who represents all members of the Johannine Jesus group. Our medieval Christian ancestors spiritually read this applying to all of Jesus' disciples throughout all time. That's why I said in the prayer, our sister and fellow creature made our mother. Aren't you all disciples? We want to be, right? We're baptized to be disciples, right? Right? 